All right, I think we're live. So thank you everyone for joining us today for our first Facebook Live Tokyo United Q&A. I'm Karen McConey with USA Triathlon and I'll be moderating today. And we're excited to welcome Taylor Nib and Eli Hemming, both members of the US national team and hopefuls for the Tokyo Olympic Games taking place this summer. At 22 years old, Taylor is the youngest member of USA Triathlon's national team. She's a two-time junior world champion, one-time under-23 world champion, three-time World Cup medalist, and in 2017, she became the youngest athlete in history to medal in a World Triathlon Series event. Eli is a two-time under-23 national champion and a one-time USA Triathlon Elite national champion, four-time World Cup medalist and eight-time Continental Cup medalist. He was the top American male at the 2018 Grand Final and has a World Triathlon Series career best finish of 11th. Both Taylor and Eli got their starts in triathlon through USA Triathlon's Youth and Junior Elite Circuit, and they now train in Boulder with the Origin Performance Squad coached by Ian O'Brien. They're just about two weeks away from the final auto qualifier for the US Olympic team, which is coming up on May 15th in Yokohama, Japan. So it's crunch time here for these athletes. Um, I'll have Taylor and Eli each give a brief opening statement about their journey from kind of first discovering triathlon as kids to climbing through the ranks and where they are now um, at the highest level of the sport. And then we will open it up to questions from there. So you can start submitting those at any time in the comments and we'll answer them as they come through kind of in the order that we receive them. Um, so I'll kick it off to Taylor for just a brief opening statement. Hi, I'm Taylor Nib. Karen, thanks for the introduction for hosting. Um, I got started in 2009 with a kids race and then I worked my way up through the junior circuit. Now I'm a member of the national team and a Tokyo 2021 Olympic hopeful and I'm looking forward to this event. Awesome, go ahead Eli. All right and uh, first off thanks everybody for being here. Um, I got started at a super young age. I was I was seven when I started triathlon. Uh, my mom started the youth triathlon team that was attached to her swim team. Um, and pretty much since then, I've been doing triathlon. So I think you can argue that I've been doing triathlon for about 20 years, which I'm old now, I guess. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I, I went up through the youth series and then the junior series. And we're really fortunate with USA Triathlon hosting all those. Um, and I think we learned a lot with that. and. Now we're, now we're in the elites. We're kicked out of the, the fun junior races. Have to go race <laughs> the big kids. When the pressure is on. No. <laughs> All right, um, we will go ahead and open it up to questions. Um, as a reminder, you can submit the questions just right here on Facebook Live in the comments and we'll answer as many as we can uh, in the order that they come in. Um, I think I'll just get things started with, let's talk about Yokohama, it's coming up in, Two weeks here, it's the final auto selection event for the Olympic triathlon team. And after that, uh, the remaining spots will be named by a selection committee, but this is clearly a pretty big race for both of you. So maybe talk a little bit about um, how your squad's been preparing, how you've been getting ready individually, and just what the next 10 days or so will look like for you. We'll go to Eli first for that. Um, yeah, you know, with, uh all last year, pretty much having no races, it's quite a bit different of a buildup that we've had. Um, we started so much earlier and could have this big, long base uh, base phase that we kind of never really been able to have and kind of uninterrupted training, which I think is for the better, honestly. Like, it's hard showing up to all these different races and being fit for all these different races. So it's kind of cool to be showing up to this, this race, um, being, knowing that we're just about as fit as we can be. Um, just have to make sure we don't remember how to race. Yeah. So I think it's also an advantage, like going back to Eli, I mean, I remember in 2014, I was a junior and it was one of my first, um, international races. And I was sitting next to Eli in the athlete briefing and like, he was a big shot, big name, um, <laughs> But like at the like, because I knew who he was, and he'd been racing a lot of junior races. But we've been doing it for a while, so I think that the break, the break um, of the year will probably help us. Help us, hopefully, we'll see. And um, we've been doing all the preparations we can. There's still a lot that's out of our control, but I'm looking forward to racing, and I'm looking forward to seeing everyone else race too. Because 
I think every year there are a few breakouts and um, like now it's been two years. So I feel like the cards will be reshuffled and you never know what can happen. Yeah, I kind of don't know where a lot of your competitors stand right now in terms of fitness and what everyone's been working on these last two years. Pretty crazy. Yeah, all we've had is um, Instagram. That's the only thing we've had. Right. <laughs> Um, what are some of your best tips for managing just a constantly changing race calendar and just staying like adaptability has been the name of the game in this last year, more than a year. Um, and just advice for youth athletes, age group athletes on just how to manage race after race, getting reshuffled and staying focused on your goal. Either of you can start. Um, well, honestly, like I think the best thing that you can do is honestly just remembering why you do triathlon in the first place and why we all do it is it's because we love it. Um, we're me and Taylor fortunate enough that we're doing it and getting paid for it, but we still do it because we love it. And you kind of have to take that with a, a grain of salt and be like, okay, well, unfortunately we don't get to do it maybe at this race, but, uh, just kind of keep your fingers crossed that the next race is going to happen. And, uh, keep training like uh, like people who love triathlon. I think that's really good advice. And to be perfectly honest, I feel like I should be the one asking for advice because <laughs> I'd love to know what other people are doing. Um, but similar to Eli, yesterday I was working with my strength coach and she's like, you really love every day, like training every day. And I'm like, yes, I do. Like, even if there weren't any races ever again, I'd keep on doing like say, oh, I probably couldn't do it as much because <laughs> without races, I couldn't do it as much. But at the same time, it's fun. And like, I'm looking at long-term goals and I want to be in this sport for as long as I can. So a year in the big picture isn't huge. Makes sense. Um, what lessons did you both learn racing in USA Triathlon's Youth and Junior Circuit? And just how did those early experiences set you up on the path to elite sport? You know, uh, I think we learned so much in juniors. It's hard to nail down one thing. Um, I think the biggest thing for me was learning like the, the cycle and the pattern of traveling to races, uh, learning how to actually prepare yourself. I felt when I went to the um, elite series, there's a dog on my computer. Um, <laughs> when uh, I went to the elite series, I was very prepared. Like I knew I had to show up. I had to do all this stuff before the race because I've been doing it for years. And uh, I think that you just learn so much uh, getting to, I mean, I travel all over the world with juniors, uh, went to New Zealand, everything. We had a few more people there to help out, but uh, it was uh, a great introductory to it. I think it's the best transition you can have because it's like, it was so smooth. And if you look at it, I think five out of the 11 members of the national team raced in the youth and junior series now. So that's a pretty big number. And it's, I love like the athlete briefing and just even the cool course preview. Now I, my first course preview, I still remember it. I was freaked out. It's very intimidating in the youth and junior series, maybe more so than when you get to like a WTS race, I might say. It was just like every team and everyone matches. Um, it's very professional and it was an awesome experience. Just like learning good habits, learning what to do, learning what to expect from a race. And it's, I loved it and I'm grateful for the experience. Awesome. Taylor, you made a decision coming from youth and junior elite triathlon to then run um, at the NCAA level in college, um, where as a lot of your teammates on the women's national team came to triathlon after NCAA running or swimming. So kind of what prompted your decision to want to go that NCAA route and focus on a single sport while at the same time balancing triathlon through all of that? There were a lot of factors. I think I, I chose the school first and the school that I chose didn't have triathlon. It only, <laughs> I'm grateful for it. It had swimming and running and I ran my all four years and I actually swam the last two and I competed my senior year in swimming. So I got to experience a lot, but at the end of the day, I thought, okay, like I'm going into college having the triathlon experience, but what do my competitors have that I don't have? And they had the college running experience. And so I felt like I did, I, or I wanted that experience to help me. Um, and I also wanted the experience of being 
like very intimidated on a lot of starting lines and knowing that, you know what, maybe 125th in certain races will be a very good race <laughs> for you. And it's like, there are 125 people on the track on start line that we normally do. So it's just a very different experience and I'm grateful for it. We'll see how it translates. Like talk to me in 10 years and maybe <laughs> we'll see if it was the right decision, <laughs> but I'm grateful for it. How many people want to put themselves in situations where they're as intimidated as possible? <laughs> it has to be a sign of somebody with big goals. That's well, I do. Cool. Yeah, but that's just me. <laughs> Um, just a reminder, uh, submit your questions on uh, Facebook Live in the comments. We want to answer questions from the group. I've got plenty, but um, but yeah, I want to answer questions from the group too, so submit them. Um, what advice do you have for young triathletes about building a long-term sustainable relationship with multi-sport and just avoiding burnout? It can be hard when you start that early to just keep the passion going and um, keep it healthy. Um, you know, the one thing that I always say, um, I, I coach a few athletes here and there. Um, and my favorite thing is consistency is king. Um, if you go out and try to walk out the door and start sprinting every day, um, it's going to be pretty tough. Um, and then the next day you're not going to want to do anything. Um, but every day, if you do a little bit and maybe throw in some fast stuff like because that's that's what we all do it for we love going fast um it's finding how to have fun with it um and keeping it consistent that you don't want to you don't start overtraining, but enough that you're having fun yeah i think my sign is that like if i'm motivated and i want to do more that's really good um <laughs> than not doing more but wanting to uh if I, if my coaches have to push me out the door for some reason then that's also a warning sign to me that i probably need to cut back a little bit and while consistency is king like eli said it's also okay to skip a workout and it's okay to take a day off and i love my days off sometimes i kind of wish i had more <laughs> but um like I've learned how to take a day off sometimes. And that, that was a skill that I had to learn after a while. And it's like, it's all a mix and the importance is keeping it fun, especially like when I was working my way up through youth and junior, I loved it and that was important. Can you talk a little bit about just the um, maybe gradual increase in training load and training hours and miles from when you were in that youth and junior, um, race distance and just kind of trying to keep your bones healthy and all of that and stay consistent and building into what you do now at the highest level. Um, maybe just how that's increased over the years. It, every year I think to myself, I don't think I can train anymore, but uh, every year my keep, coach keeps saying, yeah, I think you're going to train a little bit more next year. <laughs> um, no, it, it really has been quite an increase. And I think, uh, so my mom was my coach uh, going through youth and juniors. Um, and I think she kind of did the best thing possible is it was more of like a game than it was training. Um, it was really fun. It was, yeah, we do a lot of bike run repeat practices, but some days we go play ultimate Frisbee and it was more about enjoying it than every day you have to run an hour. You have to do this for an hour. You do have to do this for an hour. Um, it's, uh, it, your body can't take that much for that many years, <laughs> um, especially from a young age. And I think that is the biggest takeaway that I learned from my mom is uh, with younger athletes, you really have to start low um, and work your way up. Um, and volume is not the best thing of all time. Um, if you're trying to be a professional athlete, it can, uh, it can help a little bit, but it is not the end all be all. Sure. I feel like mine, like especially when I was a youth and junior, really varied by season. Like I remember I'd finished my March swim championship meets and I'd run for the first time in like three or four months. And it was very, like I really had seasons and I loved the summer because that was triathlon season and I got to actually bike, but then like September would roll around or whenever my last race of the season was and the bike would go away for a very long time, which I don't know if that helped me or hurt me, but um, even throughout college, like it was like very much quarters of the year looked very different. Like my fall coming off of my summer, I probably had a, I was probably doing 60% 
in the fall of what I was doing in the summer, which is a drastic difference in volume, but it was just like what I needed to do for that time of year. And it's what worked for me. So like both like each year changes, but also within each year, it's not like every week looks the same. Um, so that's also helpful. Makes sense. Off season is important. And then, <laughs> for you, your off season was sometimes a focus on a single sport, which I don't know how much of a break that really was, but. <laughs> it feels like a break though, or it can mm -hmm. if you enjoy Mental it. Break. Mm -hmm. Mental break. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we have a question from Mackenzie. Um, tell us about your typical race day routine and how do you prepare yourself just in that 24 hours or so leading up to the race? Um, so race day is always kind of a similar thing except for, well, I say it's similar. It can vary quite a bit because depending on uh, which race it is, depends on what time we're racing. I've raced at bright and early in the morning, like we will in Tokyo if we get to go. Um, and then uh, I've raced at 6 p.m. in the night and like it's getting dark as you're finishing up your run. Um, so really like it's spending as much time kind of relaxed uh, as you can. I usually will do like a shakeout run if I'm racing anytime after noon, um, just because my body's pretty used to exercising a lot. And if you're just sitting in on a hotel bed all day, you feel kind of lethargic getting out, trying to go race is not the best thing. Um, so usually a shakeout run, uh, then kind of move into just go do the check-in, everything. And there's kind of that its own pattern, um, kind of a couple hours before the race. Cool. I agree with Eli, like the start time really changes the typical race day routine <laughs> because it depends on how much you have time you have before, but also like for me, it bleeds into the day before because I will admit this probably, I shouldn't admit this, some days I'll put my race numbers on my bike the day of because we're racing at like 4 or 5 p.m. and like I just do it the day of, but other times like if it's a 6.30 a.m. race, I'm probably not going to do it the morning of. So just like different things like that. Um, but also when we have our course previews, that influences it. So I feel like I kind of like a pre-race meal. I have like a few I can pick from and same with race routines. I have a few that I can pick from and that work for me. And that's just what works for me. Um, looking at Yokohama, it'll be a, a bubble scenario for the first time so far really with um, these COVID safety measures. Um, Explain a little bit about how that will work and just the the blocks of time you have to leave your hotel room each day to train and how you're managing that because it is a disruption to your normal routine in a big way. Yeah, you know, we're going to be spending a, a lot of time in a hotel room. Um, I think uh, the biggest thing is that I'm going to have to bring many different activities to do in my hotel room, uh, bring a lot of books and a lot of things just to keep my mind busy. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things that uh, I kind of go crazy sitting in a hotel room. I, uh, I need to go out and like race week, I'm usually walking around the town because otherwise I'm sitting there thinking about the race and freaking out. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think uh, biggest plan for Yokohama is bring like four or five books and uh, some entertainment. So I think what we have is like everyone gets in on the 11th and then you leave on the 16th. And from my understanding, you can only leave for, I think, four reasons. And one's the race, thankfully. One's the previews. Um, and then daily, you can leave for your allotted swim slot and gym time. Because I don't think we're allowed to run outside. And like we have treadmill booking and that's your gym time. Um, so even like meals, I love meeting people or catching up with people and just having like meal time that's <laughs> fun at races and it can help the day go by quicker when your training has decreased and all you're thinking about is the race so eating alone in the hotel room when you don't get to pick your food either so there will be a lot of food packed i'm guessing um but also it's just a few days so it will be i'm just grateful we get to race but you should probably ask us on the 17th <laughs> zoom dinners there you go. <laughs> we could do Facebook Live every meal. That'd be great. <laughs> Not unusual these days. 
All right, we've got a couple of questions um, from Mel Zamiti. What trait do you attribute your success to most? That's a big one. Ooh. That's tough. Um, I would say my ability to make things fun. Um, I have found a really big enjoyment and I mean, that's the only reason that I do this sport is because I enjoy it and you'll kind of hear a theme. Every question that I have is kind of about having fun. Um, I, I find enjoyment in all this stuff and my three of my favorite things to do in life are swimming, biking and running. So finding a, a job to do that is pretty cool. Well, thank you, Melissa, for the question. Um, I'm not really sure. <laughs> no, that's a good question to ask. Maybe it's, I'm guessing there are a lot of attributes and I feel like it's more like an ability to learn and ask questions. I want to be told what I'm doing wrong more than what I'm doing right. So if anyone has feedback, especially on this. <laughs> that actually is probably true but that's a ability to learn and be coached is a huge advantage so <laughs> you're joking but i think it's true um all right from laura colvin what are your pre-race meals and your nutrition in general so i'll usually do um either some oats peanut butter honey um just anything simple um kind of roughly four hours out from the start of the race. Um, and then right before the race, I'll be having uh, some gels, um, simple sugars. I'm fairly similar. I, I used to have like a bagel with peanut butter and banana, but then I realized that bagels and peanut butter are not always easy to find in certain countries. So it's like sometimes just bread, I'll bring my own peanut butter. Um, but especially if it's later in the day, then I'll have chicken and rice beforehand. And then like nutrition in general, I think she also asked, um, mm -hmm. it's everything, anything and everything for the most part, um, everything in moderation. But if you wanted to take a tour of the refrigerator that I'm consuming out of, it's, there's a wide variety. <laughs> it's called the uh, seafood diet. I see food and I eat it. <laughs> yes. Love it. Um, all right, question from Jennifer Marie. Um, I heard Tokyo won't have international spectators. If you make it, will your family get to come watch? And if not, uh, I'm just adding this part, if not, because I think that's gonna be the case. Um, how are you planning to involve them or how are you kind of handling, um, it's gotta be difficult not having your family and friends come. How have you talked about that with your family and friends and what have those conversations looked like? You know, we've kind of worried more about uh, making it in the first place. We kind of figured we'd get to that bridge when we cross it. Um, but, you know, it's just that it's happening is kind of the biggest uh, win of the of the year. Um, so if you can't have con uh, any international uh, watchers or anything, it's kind of a, a shame. But we're just happy to be racing and happy to have some people there. I agree with Eli. I feel like it would, this sounds horrible, but I feel like it would be a very good problem to have. Um, I'm just focused on May, or May 15th and seeing what happens there. And then whatever happens, then that would be a good problem to have if that's what I'm worrying about after it. Mm -hmm. Well, USAT will be working on some things for the friends and family and fans all uh, in the US. So we've, we've got some plans to keep everyone involved and um, celebrate the team behind the team. Um, okay, from Samantha Kane, how do you manage to do all of your training and balance your social life outside of the sport at the same time? You know, most of my friends uh, kind of do the same thing. Um, <laughs> so I actually spend a lot of time with my friends out riding, out running, and that's kind of my socialization. I'm not a overly outgoing individual um so i like to spend a lot of time alone with, or with my fiance at our house um quiet time's a good time for me but uh most of my socialization is actually out training for me in college most of my friends were also in the cross-country team so again they kind of understood it if i was training or stuff like that and it wasn't like we were we were in bed fairly early and Friday and Saturday nights were very tame. So it's, 
<laughs> it is what it is. And like, especially now it's, I feel like social life is very different um, thanks to what's going on in the world. So it makes it easier in some ways because there's no pressure to do anything except for <laughs> get on a Zoom call. <laughs> That's true. Um, okay, I've got a couple more. Um, what race performance in your career are you the most proud of and why is that your, your most proud race? Um, I think uh, I might have to go for Tizzy Varos. Uh, that was the first World Cup that I won. Only World Cup that I won. It was, the, um, it was a new format for me. Um, so it was kind of overcoming a lot of different obstacles. It was a difficult travel getting there, kind of a weird situation. It's if anybody's ever heard of the town, I don't believe you. Um, <laughs> it's in a li little tiny place in Hungary. Um, it's, there's nobody that's there. And all of a sudden, like the week leading up every day, you get more and more people there. Um, and at the end of the week, it's a party. It's a, it's a festival for triathlon and it's kind of an amazing thing. Um, but it was kind of a nerve wracking uh, race coming in and, I, I think that was a, a big win. It was not just that I won the race. It was that I overcame the nerves and uh, whatnot that came along with it. This is a hard question, so thank you. <laughs> but I'll have to go probably with um, Cozumel Junior Worlds in 2016. It was a big goal the whole year and pretty much every single race like leading up to it, it was like, okay, this is in preparation for Cozumel and this is in preparation for Cozumel. And then I get to the start line, I'm like, oh, yikes, like this is like, this is the race that every other race has, this race has relieved the stress out of every other race. Um, and I had a very bad swim. I remember getting onto the ramp to exit and just wanting to like lay down. Like I was just exhausted. Um, but then it was like, I had to be very patient, which is not a strength of mine. And I like, it, it surprised me in many ways. And again, it was overcoming a lot of obstacles. So I'm grateful for that. And I think one of my favorite parts of sport is surprising myself and doing things that I wasn't sure I was possible, like was possible. And I feel like that race just embodied it on so many levels. So it was, I'm grateful for the experience. That was a pretty great race. Um, all right, question from Nick. If you could be an Olympian in another sport, um, not swim, bike, or run, what would you choose? Ooh. Curling. That's a good one. Winter sport, yeah. <laughs> well, I'd be interested in rowing. I feel like that's kind of similar, though. Not too similar, but... <laughs> <laughs> Like not be the route of what would you probably be the strongest at if you couldn't swim, bike, or run? Strong. Eating count. <laughs> but Eli, I don't know. Have you ever curled before? Do you no. have a strength in curling? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I can broom pretty well. Okay. So I, 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 like I sweep, sweep like sweep the floor. There. Yeah, I, I can sweep pretty well. <laughs> okay. Well, there you go. You have the basics down, maybe. I have no idea. All right, tell us about a coach that has been influential in your career, or coach or mentor uh, that has been influential in your career and why? Um, so I haven't had many coaches. Um, so honestly, like, I think I, I have to throw it back to my mom. Um, my mom was a huge influence and uh, it, it was awesome having her teaching me, again, to have fun with the sport it's a, a really fun thing and I can't thank her enough for making me enjoy sports. So I've had a fair amount of coaches and I'm grateful for all of them in like both swimming, running, or swimming, running and triathlon. And I think I'm really, the past few weeks being in Boulder, I'm really learning to appreciate my first triathlon coach. Um, I feel like she instilled such good habits in me that I've been able to build off of. And I'm really grateful for that, but I'm grateful for all my coaches that I've worked, or all of the coaches I've worked with. Awesome. All right, um, getting ready for Tokyo. Uh, we've heard a lot about the heat. That was sort of the biggest um, story before COVID was how our athletes gonna manage this heat we're gonna have in Tokyo, especially in the endurance sports. So tell us a little bit about the heat training 
um, that you've been doing or different tactics you've been using to specifically prepare for the heat in Tokyo and what this had strategy changes? So I've got a pretty long sauna protocol. Um, I sit in the sauna a lot, like a lot. Um, and it uh, also uh, just kind of overdressing on uh, training. So like I'll be sitting on a trainer, you know, warm on a warm day with extra clothes on like a, a big rain jacket that doesn't breathe or anything. Um, and I'll just be sitting there dripping and that's kind of the, the best thing that I've gotten so far. Um, I think the sauna does wonders for heat protocol. Yeah. So I was, Eli and I work with the same coach and we have a sauna protocol, which is becoming one of my favorite sessions of the week <laughs> because you just get to talk with other people who are in it and it's really fun. Um, but like, I'm grateful that I grew up in DC and it was very hot and humid, very similar conditions. So um, the prep I need, I'm guessing will come a little later if that's even an issue, it might not be. So you never know. How does the sauna protocol, like what time, when do you, at what point in the day do you go in and what is the, how does that fit into your training? How does, how does it train you for the heat? So it's kind of a like last session of the day. Um, say you're out running, you'll, and at the, the sauna and hop right in the sauna um, and you'll stay in there for a certain allotted time that's kind of usually building. Um, but it's, uh, it's not something that you do at the beginning of the day um, that makes all your other workouts very, very, very difficult. Um, <laughs> it, uh, it's always a last, last session of the day type of thing. Um, all right. A little differently though, because I just do it after swims because that's where the sauna is. So on Thursdays and Saturdays, that's the last session of the day. But on Wednesdays, it's the sauna session is the second. So <laughs> <laughs> it works because then the rest of the day is aerobic for us. Um, if I was doing a hard session, I wouldn't want to do it before. Got it. All right. Catching up on some of the Facebook comments and questions. Lisa Marshall said, Eli better have said his mom was his favorite coach. That would have been a problem if he had said anything else. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Noah Lamb has a question. Are you caught up on all the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies slash shows? With all your definitely coding. not. Um, <laughs> Maybe I should. Uh, Maybe you can yeah, watch them in uh, your comments. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. There you go. The Yokohama quarantine suggestion. <laughs> yeah, feel free in the Facebook comments just to add suggestions for how Eli and Taylor can spend all of the free time that they will have. Um, and then another question from Lisa, how much coffee a day do you drink? <laughs> you know, I'm trying to cut back. I, like uh, <laughs> I, I, drink, I drink a lot of coffee. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of have a problem. Um, I would say on average, I have three. Um, I'm trying to cut back to like two or one a day, um, just so that I can still actually reap the benefits of caffeine in racing. Um, cause it actually has a decent amount of benefits for endurance activities. Um, but I think that's kind of stunted with my just love of coffee. Got it. I have one cup of day purely for gaining the benefits. I had to teach myself, like I like the taste, but I didn't respond well to caffeine at first. So it's a process. <laughs> um, all right, speaking of heroes, speaking of superheroes, this is the tie to the Marvel question. Do you guys have a hero in the sport of triathlon or somebody that you look up to? If so, who is it and why that person? Ooh. You know, I, I kind of always looked up to the top level guys when I was coming up, but then I started racing them and I, I kind of have to say like, okay, they're not heroes anymore. <laughs> I have to race these guys. Um, but I can still say about like guys like Jan Ferdino. Um, I don't race Javier Gomez very often. So uh, those guys are, I mean, I grew up watching those guys race and they're just phenomenal and they never seem to have a bad day. And it's kind of amazing to watch. Well, so I never got, I never raced Gwen. Um, so I think that's also helpful and she's a really good American role model. But uh, I also, I watched 
my mom had all like the NBC productions of Kona. So I can probably name every top three finisher from 2000. And I love the long course. And I, so I have, I, I, I look up to everyone in short course and long course. You have to respect everyone who's doing it. Mm -hmm. um, Taylor, you, uh, the US women, as we know, are extremely strong, super deep field. Um, competing for Olympic slots, but also just in general on the national team, you have five or six or seven or eight medal contenders, um, even at the highest level. How does it feel for you just to be a part of such a strong American women's field and to just be a part of that, be part of that success? Um, it's a little bit challenging when you're trying to stand out, but just how does it feel to be part of that history making group of women? Well, I'm grateful for it. And I think it's a reflection of USA Triathlon and the organization and the opportunities provided. And I think it's kind of neat that even like within the group, there are a lot of different stories. So there's no kind of one path, only one route. And, but also I think the British women have outperformed us the past few years. So we still have a lot of work to do and I hope we have higher standards. So <laughs> I'm hoping that we continue to do well, also bringing other women up uh, I, you wrote an article a few weeks ago, but I don't want to be the youngest person anymore. And I hope that there are other people coming up from both the collegiate recruitment program and the junior series who are ready to compete and <laughs> try to push everyone to be better versions of themselves. Awesome. Um, and Eli, on the men's side, it's been, um, these last couple of years, we've seen the potential for the U.S. men to be meddling at the highest level. We've seen a World Triathlon Series medal from Matt McElroy, we've seen all kinds of U.S. men hitting the World Cup podium and winning World Cups for the first time. Um, so how does it feel to be part of kind of a different version of the question, like that evolution and um, the U.S. men kind of raising the game for each other and um, really no longer being comfortable being the top American, but being best in the world? Yeah, you know, it's, it's really cool being a part of it. Um, I think uh, this group of guys that's going through right now is going to we're trying to catch up with the girls um, and become the best in the world because there's no reason that we shouldn't be. Um, and I think this is the, the group of guys to start that pattern um, and looking at the junior races, they can absolutely keep, keep on with that. And I, I think there's no reason why we shouldn't be up there with the girls. Awesome. Um, all right, we've got a question from Noah Lamb. Um, question is, how would you how would you get younger kids involved in triathlon? Um, so maybe what's your what's your advice, or how would you encourage a um, a kid to come try out a triathlon? Um, honestly, I think bringing people to the races, um, bringing more people to races, spectating races, uh, that always made me want to race more. Um, I absolutely love, even to this day, just if there's a local triathlon, I'll, I'll go watch and it gets me excited about racing. And, uh, I, I think, uh, we're lucky here in Colorado where I grew up, um, that there is youth races kind of all over the place. Um, and I think that, uh, bringing a kid to that and seeing, Oh, these, these kids are my age and these kids are racing. I, I want to race too. Um, and quickly they'll find a love for it. I'd look at people who are already swimming or get people to learn how to swim and then get them on bikes and running. I think it's like a great lifelong sport and just skills that are helpful in general. I, I There was actually a college graduation requirement um, at the school that I went to that you had to be able to swim a 75. So it could, and some people couldn't, so they had to take like a swim class. But so I think that that like, each of the aspects involved in triathlon could be helpful in other areas, but as Eli said, just exposing them to it and getting groups of friends together. Because I think that especially as a kid, you're gonna do what your friends are doing or what's fun. And if your friends are doing it, it's more fun. You wanna share the experience with other people, probably all the way through your life, but especially as a kid. For sure. Yeah, and it's really three activities that kids do all the time anyways. So I'm in the local pool, ride your bike around the neighborhood and just like run everywhere. <laughs> so it's a natural fit. 
So if any, anybody's watching and considering getting your kids involved or if you're a kid um, interested in trying triathlon, <laughs> we've got options and it's fun. Um, okay, question from Amy Quinn. Um, when did you start triathlon? Tell us about your, your first ever race and getting started in the sport. So <laughs> my first ever triathlon, um, it was called the Fall Frenzy in Parker, Colorado. Um, it was uh, attached with a, a, uh, just an age group race, uh, age group sprint. Um, and they had just a kid's race along with it. Um, and the first year, uh, we, uh, I was too young to race it. And so we, we knew the race director of it. And so my mom, like, we went up and tried to like convince him to let me race. Um, he said, no, you got to wait till you're seven. Um, and so the next year I was all pumped and amped and ready to go. And, uh, yeah, fall frenzy, uh, Parker, Colorado. 2002. Yeah. 2002. <laughs> In my mind. 2009. So I was 11 at the tri Columbia kids with a Z triathlon. Tri Columbia used to have the Columbia Triathlon Olympic distance and Eagle Man, and they happened to have this kids race. And I don't think there were even results, but the next year I experienced what Eli had and I wanted to do another race and there were minimum age limits or minimum age requirements. So I get that. Um, <laughs> but yes, it was a fun kids race and I just loved it from the start, everything. Awesome. Um, all right, another one from Lisa Marshall. Which elite cup race was your favorite and your least favorite and why? Uh, we're talking junior races. I think so. Yeah. Um, ooh, so my least favorite was Des Moines. That race was always so hot. Uh, it, it, gosh, I think I went there probably eight times before I finally figured it out. Like, so eight years in a row before I finally won it. And every year I was like, I should have won this race. Um, <laughs> uh, so that was my least favorite. Um, my favorite is probably, um, maybe in Monroe in Seattle. I think that was a, a really fun race. Um, it helps that that was the only junior cup that I ever won. So. so the women got to race at 7am for Flatlands in Iowa. So I actually liked it. I enjoyed that race. Um, <laughs> It was, but I enjoyed all the junior races. I think they were just great. My, I think my least favorite race was just a specific race because I put too much pressure on myself. I crashed at the first turn. It was just not good. It was my first youth, na my only youth nationals. Um, but I think that like one of my favorite races actually was probably the team relay at Westchester because it felt like the season was over and you just got to team up and it was the mixed team relay, which now is going to be in the Olympics, which is kind of neat. And I'm guessing it might be the largest relay in the world because I feel like there were like 50 teams and poor Steve Kelly had to deal with the substitutions every single <laughs> night before. Um, but it was an awesome experience and it was awesome racing with other people and it was just fast and it just hurt the whole time, but it was a great experience. And I think it, I'm hoping it'll carry on now. <laughs> Absolutely. That actually reminds me, we should talk about the mixed relay for Tokyo. It'll be a brand new medal event for the first time at the Olympic Games. And as youth and juniors, you've been competing in the mixed relay format longer than a lot of triathletes in the U.S., kind of just becoming a thing at the age group level. Um, so tell us what, it, what, kind of start with what the mixed relay format is to give people a sense of what they'll see in Tokyo and then what you love about it, what, what makes it fun. Okay, to, to start, it's, uh, it's a relay with uh, two men and two women. Um, women go first, it's women, men, women, men. Um, and it's everybody does a little triathlon. Um, it's about 20 minutes each and it is fast and furious and so unbelievably fun. Um, it's kind of crazy because it's, it is something that that junior racing kind of prepared you for. Um, and going through transitions, uh, I don't think I've ever sprinted through a transition so hard as in a mixed team relay, cause it, it matters so much more. Um, so it's, it's pretty fun. I, I'm really excited that, uh, it's actually a Olympic sport now and I really hope to be there in, in Tokyo. Awesome. Okay. 
What do you love about Mixed Relay, Taylor? Oh, I love the team aspect because I feel like in like any relay in swimming, you kind of just swim a little faster. And in the relay, you really can't let anyone down. But it's just so different because you'll be, if you're the first woman, you're like lining up against other people. And even then, like, it's just kind of reshuffled from what a normal race will be. But if you're the third woman um, or second man or fourth man, you just can be handed off at any time and you're just racing people around you. And it's, I feel like maybe there are tactics, but I feel like people, it's such an evolving sport still. And that's what's so fun about it because it's so new and people I remember like a few years ago New Zealand had like these really cool lace or shoes and stuff like that and people are trying things out and it's kind of like you can walk up the morning of the race and you're like what is that team doing but <laughs> um, there's still a lot to learn I feel like there's still a lot of tactics to be worked out and learn how to train for it effectively and race it well so it's fun because it's new. Yeah, I know our high performance staff has been throwing in all kinds of four person combos the last few years just to kind of see what happens. So it'll be really fun to see in Tokyo. Um, okay, question from Noah Lamb. Um, what is your favorite swim drill, bike drill, and run drill? If you have a favorite drill, maybe just a go to. Um, let's see. I think uh, a favorite swim drill. Um, Honestly, I believe just doing a uh, one arm uh, stroke uh, is super beneficial for just about anybody. Um, that's always just a go-to of mine. I can't say it's a favorite because it's never, it never gets easier. <laughs> um, let's see, any, for the bike, any parking lot skills um, that I think knowing how to turn quickly, do all these random stuff, um, even reaching down while you're riding slowly, trying to pick up a water bottle. Um, I think those are super invaluable. Um, and then run drills, I think just anything that makes you uh, run pretty. <laughs> That's different for everybody. Taylor? So one of the things I have to work on always with swimming is keeping my head down. And when you race a triathlon and you're sighting, my head just comes up even more. So one of my favorite drills is I actually like look back behind myself at my feet. So then I can kind of reset my head and then my whole body position. It's not always fun and it probably looks crazy, but it just like, it helps me swim better. So all my favorite drills just help me perform better, I guess. And then bike drills, I probably should be doing more parking lot drills and all the stuff, Eli. <laughs> said I don't really have a favorite bike drill I like riding without power <laughs> or with power um I just I don't love bike drills and then run drills I have like a set a series that I do that just works for me it's like a mixture of skipping and high knees and butt kicks and great find and I've been doing it for a while and I really like I think it just gets me ready cool um from Laura Colvin do you use Zwift and if not um, any other app that you use with your trainer? Um, I typically just use the uh, the Wahoo uh, app, um, and then I, if I'm gonna be sitting on a trainer, I usually just am staring at my phone or staring at the the wall, hurting. Sounds super fun. <laughs> no, that's why I don't ride the trainer very often. <laughs> Uh, I learned about Zwift in April or like a year ago and I enjoy it. Um, but I actually will admit that I use the Wahoo app with Zwift because there were some times where I'd like be doing this route and I'd get to like the top of a hill or something. And then like the trainer would just like lose all resistance because you're descending. And I was in the middle of an interval and I'm just like, this is, I need control. I just, if I want to ride easy, I want to ride easy. If I want to ride hard, I'll ride hard. Um, and so I control it with the Wahoo app but I will sometimes look at Swift, but also I enjoy, especially when races are coming up, I like to watch replays of the races. So I think I've watched every single thing on triathlon live multiple times. They have taken some away and, but I enjoy it and I enjoy watching the races because I feel like there's so much to learn. And I feel like I pick up, even if I watch the same race every day for a week, I could pick up something different each time. So, and I also listen to music. 
there's a lot going on, <laughs> like Eli. <laughs> I, I have some music sometimes, most of the time. <laughs> Two different approaches. Um, all right, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, do Do you follow any other sports outside of triathlon, whether it's pro sports in your hometown or college teams, um, etc.? Um, I really enjoy watching. Uh, running and I really enjoy watching mountain biking. Um, so my fiance is trying to become a professional runner. So I have to keep up with running. Um, and, uh, I love mountain biking. Uh, the world cup is amazing to watch. Well, I enjoy watching running too and swimming. There's, there haven't been a lot of those recently, but I enjoy watching it. And I feel like there's so much to learn about from the highest level of the sport and of each sport that we do and so it's fun to learn how they kind of prepare themselves cool um hopefully you'll get some good track and marathon races coming up in the next few months here um what is your favorite from bryant howard what's your favorite test set in each discipline to check fitness gains a race yeah, I, I, I think so. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. I feel like I probably have tried to test fitness too many times. And the issue is that like, if you try to test fitness, you probably won't have as much on race day. So like my best races are when I was either unable to test the fitness or I wasn't allowed to, and then I raced better. So for me, that's just what works. But maybe Eli has a test set that really works for him. But <laughs> No, I, I think I have to agree with that. Um, I think it's kind of just watching overall how the training's going, like saying if watch kind of like a series of bike workouts and like if I'm hitting my power easily, like I know, yeah, I'm pretty fit. But uh, I think by the actual test sets themselves get a little overdone. All right. Um, this will maybe be our last question for the audience from Amy Quinn. I'm racing Richmond this weekend. Any tips for me? Ooh. Um, well, hopefully it's not raining because every time I've raced in Richmond, I think it rained. Um, and if it is, I hope you have some good set of tires. <laughs> um, just have fun with it. I mean, uh, it's all about going as hard as you can and on that given day. Um, so have fun and race smart. Well, I'm not sure. I'm guessing the pre-race stuff is tomorrow and the race is on Sunday. So don't be intimidated by the pre-race um, teams and all their practicing. I know I was my first time when I was just like my mom and I just went. I didn't have a team I was affiliated with. It was like, wow, like there's all these people in bike packs. And I remember the day before I was deciding, like, do I wear the clipless pedals or just sneakers? Because it's such a short bike. But um, I actually, <laughs> I had the worst transition first transition, well, probably um, my first race there, one of my friends came out behind me in the swim and exited the transition before me. So just get your wetsuit off, clip your helmet, and do the little things, and don't stress about it. Enjoy racing. Awesome. Good advice. Um, all right. Well, that's pretty much all the time we have. Um, I want to thank both of you and everybody else for tuning in and joining us today. Oh, wait. We have one more question. Um, I need Eli to introduce us to the two dogs that I think have been staying next to him this whole time. This is Fudge. Let's look at right here. This is Fudge. And we got Pree over here. And yes, I am sitting on the floor. <laughs> They're beautiful. They've been very polite and quiet you this whole very time. Nice. Yes, you have been very nice. I will take you out. <laughs> All right. Um, so. These athletes will be headed to Yokohama. Um, like we mentioned, the Olympic auto selection events, so that'll be a pretty big race. Um, it's May 15th in Japan, but it's May 14th in the US. Um, so check the schedule for that. Um, it'll be on Triathlon Live. So make sure you tune in. I think it's like $2 for a subscription for the month, or you can do the annual pass and follow um, our team as they race all throughout the year. Um, We'll be doing more of these Tokyo United Q and A's with Olympic and Paralympic Cope Poles just um, in the lead up to Tokyo, the Olympic and the Paralympic Games. So look out for more of these and we hope you'll join us next time. Um, and then one last statement from Lisa Marshall, best of luck and we'll be cheering for you. Hope to see you both in Tokyo. 
<laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Karen, for moderating and hosting. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, thank you so much. Let's do a screenshot. Okay, ready? On three, we'll all wave to the camera. One, two, three. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. We'll see you next time.